Bhakti Yoga by Swami Vivekananda Prayer He is the soul of the universe. He is immortal. His is the rulership. He is the all-knowing, the all-pervading, the protector of the universe, the eternal ruler. None else is there efficient to govern the world eternally. He who at the beginning of creation projected Brahma, meaning the universal consciousness, and who delivered the Vedas unto him, seeking liberation I go for refuge unto that effulgent one whose light turns the understanding towards the Atman. From Swatashvatara Upanishad, Volume 4, 17 and 18. Definition of Bhakti Bhakti Yoga is a real, genuine search after the Lord, a search beginning, continuing and ending in love. One single moment of the madness of extreme love to God brings us eternal freedom. Bhakti, says Narada in his explanation of the Bhakti aphorisms, is intense love to God. When a man gets it, he loves all, hates none, he becomes satisfied forever. This love cannot be reduced to an earthly benefit. Because so long as worldly desires last, that kind of love does not come. Bhakti is greater than karma, greater than yoga, because these are intended for an object in view, while bhakti is its own fruition, its own means and its own end. Bhakti has been the one constant theme of our sages. Apart from the special writers on bhakti, such as Sandhilya or Narada, the great commentators on the Vyasu Sutras, evidently advocates of knowledge, jnana, have also something very suggestive to say about love. Even when the commentator is anxious to explain many, if not all, of the texts so as to make them import a sort of dry knowledge, the sutras, in the chapter on worship especially, do not lend themselves to be easily manipulated in that fashion. There is not really so much difference between knowledge, jnana, and love, bhakti, as people sometimes imagine. We shall see as we go on that, in the end, they converge and meet at the same point. So also it is with Raja Yoga, which, when pursued as a means to attain liberation, and not, as unfortunately it frequently becomes in the hands of charlatans and mystery mongers, as an instrument to hoodwink the unwary, leads us also to the same goal. The one great advantage of Bhakti is that it is the easiest and the most natural way to reach the great divine end in view. Its great disadvantage is that in the lower forms it oftentimes degenerates into hideous fanaticism. The fanatical crew in Hinduism or Mohammedanism or Christianity have always been almost exclusively recruited from these worshippers on the lower planes of bhakti. That singleness of attachment, nishita, to a loved object, without which no genuine love can grow, is very often also the cause of the denunciation of everything else. All the weak and undeveloped minds in every religion or country have only one way of loving their own ideal, i.e. by hating every other ideal. 
Herein is the explanation of why the same man, who is so lovingly attached to his own ideal of God, so devoted to his own ideal of religion, becomes a howling fanatic as soon as he sees or hears anything of any other ideal. This kind of love is somewhat like the canine instinct of guarding the master's property from intrusion. Only the instinct of the dog is better than the reason of man, for the dog never mistakes its master for an enemy in whatever dress he may come before it. Again, the fanatic loses all power of judgment, Personal considerations are, in this case, of such absorbing interest that to him it is no right or wrong. But the one thing he is always particularly careful to know is, who says it? The same man who is kind, good, honest and loving to people of his own opinion will not hesitate to do the vilest deeds when they are directed against persons beyond the pale of his own religious brotherhood. But this danger exists only in that stage of bhakti called the preparatory. When bhakti has become ripe and has passed into that form which is caned the supreme, no more is there any fear of these hideous manifestations of fanaticism that soul which is overpowered by his higher form of bhakti is too near the god of love to become an instrument for the diffusion of hatred. It is not given to all of us to be harmonious in the building up of our characters in this life. Yet we know that that character is of the noblest type in which all these three, knowledge, love and yoga, are harmoniously fused. Three things are necessary for a bird to fly. The two wings and the tail as a rudder for steering. Jnana or knowledge is the one wing. Bhakti or love is the other. And yoga is the tail that keeps up the balance. For those who cannot pursue all these three forms of worship together in harmony and take up therefore bhakti alone as their way, it is necessary always to remember that forms and ceremonials, though absolutely necessary for the progressive soul, have no other value than taking us to that state in which we feel the most intense love to God. There is a little difference in opinion between the teachers of knowledge and those of love, though both admit the power of bhakti. The jnanis hold bhakti to be an instrument of liberation. The bhaktas or devotees look upon it as both the instrument and the thing to be attained. To my mind, this is a distinction without much difference. In fact, bhakti, when used as an instrument, really means a lower form of worship, and the higher form becomes inseparable from the lower form of realization at a later stage. Each seems to lay a great stress upon his own peculiar method of worship, forgetting that with perfect love true knowledge is bound to come even unsought, and that from perfect knowledge true love is inseparable. Bearing this in mind, let us try to understand what the great Vedantic commentators have to say on this subject. In explaining the Sutra, Bhagwan Shankara says, Thus people say, He is devoted to the king. 
he is devoted to the guru. They say this of him who follows his guru and does so having that following as the one end in view. Similarly, they say, the loving wife meditates on her loving husband. Here also a kind of eager and continuous remembrance is meant. This is devotion according to Shankara. Meditation again is a constant remembrance of the thing meditated upon, flowing like an unbroken stream of oil poured out from one vessel to another. When this kind of remembering has been attained in relation to God, all bondages break. Thus, it is spoken of in the scriptures regarding constant remembering as a means to liberation. This remembering again is of the same form as seeing, because it is of the same meaning as in the passage, When he who is far and near is seen, the bonds of the heart are broken, all doubts vanish, and all effects of work disappear. He who is near can be seen, but he who is far can only be remembered. Nevertheless, the scripture says that we have to see him who is near as well as him who is far, thereby indicating to us that the above kind of remembering is as good as seeing. This remembrance, when exalted, assumes the same form as seeing. Worship is constant remembering, as may be seen from the essential texts of scriptures. Knowing, which is the same as repeated worship, has been described as constant remembering. Thus the memory which has attained to the height of what is as good as direct perception, is spoken of in the Shruti as a means of liberation. This Atman is not to be reached through various sciences, nor by intellect, nor by much study of the Vedas. Whomsoever this Atman desires, by him is the Atman attained, unto him this Atman discovers himself. Here, after saying that by mere hearing, thinking and meditating are not the means of attaining this Atman, it is said, Whom this Atman desires, by him this Atman is attained. The extremely beloved is desired by whomsoever this Atman is extremely beloved. He becomes the most beloved of the Atman. So that this beloved may attain the Atman, the Lord himself helps. For it has been said by the Lord, Those who are constantly attached to me and worship me with love, I give that direction to their will by which they come to me. Therefore, it is said that to whomsoever this remembering, which is of the same form as direct perception, is very dear, because it is dear to the object of such memory perception, he is desired by the Supreme Atman, by him the Supreme Atman is attained. This constant remembrance is denoted by the word bhakti. So says Bhagavan Ramanuja in his commentary on the Sutra. In commenting on the Sutra of Patanjali, i.e. Or by the worship of the Supreme Lord, Bhoja says, Pranidhana 
is the sort of bhakti in which, without seeking results such as sense enjoyments, all works are dedicated to that teacher of teachers. Bhagavan Vyasa also, when commenting on the same, defines pranidhanya as the form of bhakti by which the mercy of the Supreme Lord comes to the yogi and blesses him by granting him his desires. According to Shani Dila, bhakti is intense love to God. The best definition is, however, that given by the king of bhaktas, Pralada. That deathless love which the ignorant have for the fleeting objects of the senses, as I keep meditating on thee, may not that sort of intense love for thee slip away from my heart. Love for whom? For the Supreme Lord Ishwara. Love for any other being however great, cannot be bhakti. For, as Ramunaja says in his Sri Pyasya, quoting an ancient Acharya, or great teacher, From Brahma to a clump of grasses, all things that live in the world are slaves of birth and death caused by karma. Therefore, they cannot be helpful as objects of meditation because they are all in ignorance and subject to change. In commenting on the word anurakti used by Shandilya, the commentator Swapneshwara says that it means anu or after and rakti, attachment, meaning the attachment which comes off or after the knowledge of the nature and glory of God. Else, a blind attachment to anyone, example, to a wife or children, would be bhakti. We plainly see, therefore, that bhakti is a series or succession of mental efforts at religious realization, beginning with ordinary worship and ending in a supreme intensity of love for Ishwara. The Philosophy of Ishwara Who is Ishwara? From whom is the birth, continuation and dissolution of the universe? He is Ishwara, the eternal, the pure, the ever free the Almighty, the All-Knowing, the All-Merciful, the Teacher of all teachers, and above all, He, the Lord, is of His own nature, inexpressible love. These certainly are the definitions of a personal God. Are there then two gods? The not this, not this, the Sat-Chit-Ananda, the existence-knowledge-bliss of the philosopher and this God of love of the Bhakta. No, it is the same Sat-Chit-Ananda who is also the God of love, the impersonal and personal in one. It has always to be understood that the personal God worshipped by the Bhakta is not separate or different from the Brahman. All the Brahman, the one without a second, only the Brahman as unity or absolute is too much of an abstraction to be loved and worshipped. So the Bhakta chooses the relative aspect of Brahman, that is Ishwara, the Supreme Ruler. To use a simile, 
Brahman is as the clay or substance out of which an infinite variety of articles are fashioned. As clay, they are all one, but form or manifestation differentiates them. Before every one of them was made, they all existed potentially in the clay, and of course they are identical substantially but when formed, and so long as the form remains, they are separate and different. The clay mouse can never become a clay elephant, because as manifestations, form alone makes them what they are, though as unformed clay they are all one. Ishwara is the highest manifestation of the absolute reality or, in other words, the highest possible reading of the Absolute by the human mind. Creation is eternal, and so also is Ishwara. In the fourth pada of the fourth chapter of his sutras, after stating the almost infinite power for and knowledge which will come to the liberated soul after the attainment of moksha, Vyasa makes the remark, in an aphorism, that none, however, will get the power of creating, ruling, and dissolving the universe, because that belongs to God alone. In explaining the sutra, it is easy for the dualistic commentators to show how it is all ever impossible for a subordinate soul or jiva to have the infinite power and total independence of God. The thorough dualistic commentator Madhavacharya deals with this passage in his usual summary method by quoting a verse from the Varaha Purana. In explaining this aphorism, the commentator Ramanuja says, This doubt being raised, whether among the powers of the liberated souls is included that unique power of the Supreme One, that is, of creation, etc., of the universe, and even the lordship of all, or whether without that, the glory of the liberated consists only in the direct perception of the Supreme One, we get as an argument the following. It is reasonable that the liberated gets the lordship of the universe, because the scriptures say, he attains to extreme sameness with the Supreme One, and all his desires are realized. Now, extreme sameness and realization of all desires cannot be attained without the unique power of the Supreme Lord, namely, that of governing the universe. Therefore, to attain the realization of all desires and the extreme sameness with the Supreme, we must all admit that the liberated get the power of ruling the whole universe. To this we reply that the liberated get all the powers except that of ruling the universe. Ruling the universe is guiding the form and the life and the desires of all the sentient and the non-sentient beings. The liberated ones, from whom all that veils his true nature has been removed, only enjoy the unobstructed perception of Brahman, but do not possess the power of ruling the universe. This is proved from the scriptural text, from whom all these things are born, by whom all that are born to live, unto whom they departing return, I ask about it. That is Brahman. If this quality of ruling the universe be a quality common even to the liberated, then this text would not apply as a definition of Brahma, 
defining him through his rulership of the universe. The uncommon attributes alone define a thing. Therefore, in texts like My Beloved Boy, Alone, In the Beginning, there existed the one without a second that saw and felt I will give birth to the many that projected heat Brahman indeed alone existed in the beginning that one evolved that projected a blessed form the Kshatra all these gods are Kshatras Varuna, Soma, Rudra, Parjanya, Yama, Mrityu, Ishana. Atman indeed existed alone in the beginning. Nothing else vibrated. He thought of projecting the world. He projected the world after. Alone, Narayana existed. Neither Brahma nor Ishana, nor the Dvyaya Prithvihi, nor the stars, nor water, nor fire, nor Soma, nor the sun. He did not take pleasure alone. He, after his meditation, had one daughter, the ten organs, etc., and in others as who living in the earth is separate from the earth who living in the Atman etc. The Shrutis speak of the Supreme One as the subject of the work of ruling the universe nor in these descriptions of the ruling of the universe is there any position for the liberated soul by which such a soul may have the ruling of the universe ascribed to it? In explaining the next sutra, Ramanuja says, If you say it is not so, because there are direct texts in the Vedas in evidence to the contrary, these texts refer to the glory of the liberated in the spheres of the subordinate deities. This also is an easy solution of the difficulty. Although the system of Ramanuja admits the unity of the total within the totality of the existence, there are, according to him, eternal differences. Therefore, for all practical purposes, this system also being dualistic, it was easy for Ramanuja to keep the distinction between the personal soul and the personal God very clear. We shall now try to understand what the great representative of the Advaita school has to say on this point. We shall see how the Advaita systems maintain all the hopes and aspirations of the dualistic intact and at the same time propounds its own solution of the problem in consonance with the high destiny of divine humanity. Those who aspire to retain their individual mind even after liberation and to remain distinct will have ample opportunity of realizing their aspirations and enjoy the blessing of the qualified Brahman. These are they who have been spoken of in the Bhagavata Purana. Thus, O King, such are the glorious qualities of the Lord that the sages whose only pleasure is in the self and from whom all fetters have fallen off, even they love the omnipresent with the love that is for love's sake. These are they who are spoken of by the Sankhyas 
as getting merged in this nature of the cycle so that after attaining perfection they may come out in the next as lords of world systems but none of these ever becomes equal to God or Ishwara. Those who attain to that state where there is neither creation nor created nor creator, where there is neither knower nor knowable nor knowledge, where there is neither I nor thou nor he, where there is neither subject nor object nor relation. There, who is seen by whom? Such persons have gone beyond everything. Two, where words cannot go, nor mind. Gone to that which the Shrutis declare as not this, not this. But for those who cannot or will not reach the state there will inevitably remain the triune vision of the one undifferentiated Brahman as nature, soul, and the interpenetrating sustainer of both, Ishwara. So when Pralada forgot himself, he found neither the universe nor its cause. All was to him one infinite undifferentiated by name and form. But as soon as he remembered that he was Pralada, there was the universe before him, and with it the Lord of the universe, the repository of an infinite number of blessed qualities. So it was with the blessed gopis. So long as they had lost their sense of their own personal identity and individuality, they were all Krishnas. And when they began to think of him as the one to be worshipped, they were gopis again. And immediately unto them appeared Krishna with a smile on his lotus face, clad in yellow robes and having garlands on, the embodied conqueror in beauty and the god of love from the Bhagavata Purana. Now go back to our Acharya Shankara. Those, he says, who by worshipping the qualified Brahman attain conjunction with the Supreme Ruler, preserving their own mind, is their glory limited or unlimited? This doubt arising, we get this as an argument. Their glory should be unlimited because of the scriptural texts, they attain their own kingdom. To him all the gods offer worship. Their desires are fulfilled in all the worlds. As an answer to this, Vyasa writes, Without the power of ruling the universe, barring the power of creation, etc., of the universe, the other powers such as anima, are acquired by the liberated. As to ruling the universe, that belongs to the eternally perfect Ishwara. Why? Because he is the subject of all the scriptural texts as regards creation, etc., and the liberated souls are not mentioned therein in any connection whatsoever. The Supreme Lord, indeed, is alone engaged in ruling the universe. The texts as to creation all point to him. Besides, there is given the adjective ever perfect. Also, the scriptures say that the powers, anima, etc., of the others are as from the search after and the worship of God. Therefore, they have no place in the ruling of the universe. Again, on account of their possessing their own minds, it is possible that their wills may differ, 
and that whilst one desires creation, another may desire destruction. The only way of avoiding this conflict is to make all wills subordinate to some one will. Therefore, the conclusion is that the will of the liberated are dependent on the will of the supreme ruler. Bhakti, then, can be directed towards Brahman only in his personal aspect. The way is more difficult for those whose mind is attached to the Absolute. Bhakti has to float on smoothly with the current of our nature. True, it is that we cannot have any idea of the Brahman which is not anthropomorphic, but is it not equally true of everything we know? The greatest psychologist the world has ever known, Bhagwan Kapila, demonstrated ages ago that human consciousness is one of the elements in the makeup of all the objects of our perception and conception, internal as well as external, beginning with our bodies and going up to Ishwara, we may see that every object of our perception is this consciousness plus something else, whatever that may be, and this unavoidable mixture is what we ordinarily think of as reality. Indeed it is, and ever will be, all of the reality that is possible for the human mind to know. Therefore, to say that Ishwara is unreal because he is anthropomorphic is sheer nonsense. It sounds very much like the Occidental squabble on idealism and realism, which fearful looking quarrel has for its foundation a mere play on the word real. The idea of Ishwara covers all the ground ever denoted and connoted by the word real. And Ishwara is as real as anything else in the universe and after. The word real means nothing more than what has now been pointed out. Such is our philosophical conception of Ishwara. Spiritual Realization The Aim of Bhakti Yoga to the Bhakta, these dry details are necessary only to strengthen his will. Beyond that, they are of no use to him. For he is treading on a path which is fitted very soon to lead him beyond the hazy and turbulent regions of reason, to lead him to the realm of realization. He soon, through the mercy of the Lord, reaches a plain where pedantic and powerless reason is left far behind, and the mere intellectual groping through the dark gives place to the daylight of direct perception. He no more reasons and believes. He almost perceives. He no more argues. He senses. And is not this seeing God and feeling God and enjoying God higher than anything else? Nay, Bhaktas have not been wanting who have maintained that it is higher than even moksha or liberation. And is it not also the highest utility? There are people, and a good many of them too, in the world who are convinced that only that is of use and utility which brings to man creature comforts. Even religion, God, eternity, soul, none of these is of any use to them, as they do not bring them money or physical comfort. To such all those things which do not gratify the senses and appease the appetites are of no utility. In every mind, utility, however, is conditioned by its own peculiar wants. To men, therefore, 
who never rise higher than eating, drinking, begetting progeny, and dying. The only gain is the sense enjoyment, and they must wait to go through many more births and reincarnations to learn to feel even the faintest necessity for anything higher. For those to whom the eternal interests of the soul are of much higher value than the fleeting interests of this mundane life, to whom the gratification of the senses is but like the thoughtless play of the baby, to them God and the love of God form the highest and the only utility of human existence. Thank God there are some such still living in this world of too much worldliness. Bhakti, as we have said, is divided into the gauni, or the preparatory, and para, or the supreme forms. We shall find, as we go on, how the preparatory stage we unavoidably stand in need of many concrete helps to enable us to get on. And indeed, the mythological and symbological parts of all religions are natural growths which early environ the aspiring soul and help it Godward. It is also a significant fact that spiritual giants have been produced only in those systems of religion where there is an exuberant growth of rich mythology and ritualism. The dry fanatical forms of religion which attempt to eradicate all that is poetical, all that is beautiful and sublime, all that gives a firm grasp to the infant mind tottering its way Godward, the forms which attempt to break down the very ridge poles of the spiritual and in their ignorant and superstitious conceptions of truth try to drive away all that is life-giving, all that furnishes the formative material to the spiritual plant growing in the human soul. Such forms of religion too soon find that all that is left of them is but an empty shell, a contentless frame of words and sophistry, with perhaps a little flavour of a kind of social scavengering, or the so-called spirit of reform. The vast mass of those whose religion is like this are conscious or unconscious materialists. The end and aim of their lives here and hereafter being enjoyment, which indeed is to them the alpha and the omega of human life, and which is their ishtapurta, sacrifices and philanthropic works, work like street cleaning and scavengering, intended for the material comfort of man, is according to them the be-all and end-all of human existence. And the sooner the followers of this curious mix of ignorance and fanaticism come out in their true colours and join, as they well deserve to do, the ranks of atheists and materialists, the better will it be for the world. One ounce of the practice of righteousness and of spiritual self-realization outweighs tons of frothy talk and nonsensical sentiments. Show us one, but one, gigantic spiritual genius growing out of all this dry dust of ignorance and fanaticism and if you cannot close your mouths open the windows of your hearts to the clear light of truth and sit like children at the feet of those who know what they are talking about the sages of India let us then listen attentively to what they have to say The need of a guru. Every soul is destined to be perfect, and every being in the end will attain the state of perfection. 
Whatever we are now is the result of our acts and thoughts in the past, and whatever we shall be in the future will be the result of what we think and do now. But this, the shaping of our own destinies, does not preclude our receiving help from outside. Nay, in the vast majority of cases, such help is absolutely necessary. When it comes, the higher powers and possibilities of the soul are quickened. Spiritual life is awakened, growth is animated, and man becomes holy and perfect in the end. This quickening impulse cannot be derived from books. The soul can only receive impulses from another soul and not from nothing else. We may study books all our lives. We may become very intellectual, but in the end we find that we have not developed at all spiritually. It is not true that a high order of intellectual development always goes hand in hand with a proportionate development of the spiritual side in man. In studying books, we are sometimes deluded into thinking that thereby we are being spiritually helped. But if we analyze the effect of the study of books on ourselves, we shall find that at the utmost it is only our intellect that derives profit from such studies and not our inner spirit. This inadequacy of books to quicken spiritual growth is the reason why, although almost every one of us can speak most wonderfully on spiritual matters, when it comes to action and the living of a truly spiritual life, we find ourselves awfully deficient. To quicken the spirit, the impulse must come from another soul. The person from whose soul such impulses comes is called the guru, the teacher, and the person to whose soul the impulse is conveyed is called the shishya, the student. To convey such an impulse to any soul in the first place the soul from which it proceeds must possess the power of transmitting it, as it were, to another. And in the second place, the soul to which it is transmitted must be fit to receive it. The seed must be a living seed, and the field must be ready ploughed. And when both these conditions are fulfilled, a wonderful growth of genuine religion takes place. The true preacher of religion has to be of wonderful capabilities and clever shall his hero be. And when both of these are really wonderful and extraordinary, then will a splendid spiritual awakening result and not otherwise. Such alone are the real teachers and such alone are also the real students the real aspirants. All others are only playing with spirituality. They have just a little curiosity awakened, just a little intellectual aspiration kindled in them, but are merely standing on the outward fringes of the horizon of religion. There is no doubt some value even in that, as it may in course of time result in the awakening of a real thirst for religion, and it is as mysterious a law of nature that as soon as the field is ready, the seed must and does come. As soon as the soul earnestly desires to have religion, the transmitter of the religion force must and does appear to that soul. When the power that attracts the light of religion in the receiving soul is full and strong, the power which answers to that attraction and sends in light does come as a matter of course. There are, however, great dangers in the way. There is, for instance, 
the danger of the receiving soul of its mistaking momentary emotions for real religious yearning. We must study that in ourselves. Many a time in our lives, somebody dies whom we love. We receive a blow. We feel that the world is slipping between our fingers and that we want something surer and higher and that we must become religious. In a few days, that wave of feeling has passed away and we are left stranded just where we were before. We are all of us often mistaking such impulses for real thirst after religion. But as long as these momentary emotions are thus mistaken, that continuous real craving of the soul for religion will not come and we shall not find the true transmitter of spirituality into our nature. So whenever we are tempted to complain of our search after the truth, that we desire so much, proving vain. Instead of so complaining, our first duty ought to be to look into our own souls and find whether the craving in the heart is real. Then, in the vast majority of cases, it would be discovered that we were not fit for receiving the truth, that there was no real thirst for spirituality. There are still greater dangers in regard to the transmitter, the guru. There are many who, though immersed in ignorance, yet, in the pride of their hearts, fancy they know everything. And not only do not stop there, but offer to take others on their shoulders, and thus the blind leading the blind, both fall into the ditch. Fools dwelling in darkness, wise in their own conceit, and puffed up with vain knowledge, go round and round, staggering to and fro, like blind men led by the blind. The world is full of these. Everyone wants to be a teacher. Every beggar wants to make a gift of a million dollars. Just as these beggars are ridiculous, so are these teachers. Qualifications of the aspirant and the teacher. How are we to know a teacher then? The sun requires no torch to make him visible. We need not light a candle in order to see him. When the sun rises, we instinctively become aware of the fact. And when a teacher of men comes to help us, the soul will instinctively know that truth has already begun to shine upon it. Truth stands on its own evidence. It does not require any other testimony to prove it true. It is self-effulgent. It penetrates into the innermost corners of our nature. And in its presence, the whole universe stands up and says, This is truth. The teachers whose wisdom and truth shine like the light of the sun are the very greatest the world has known and they are worshipped as God by the major proportion of humanity. But we may get help from comparatively lesser ones also. Only we ourselves do not possess intuition enough to judge properly of the man from whom we receive teaching and guidance. So there ought to be certain tests, certain conditions for the teacher to satisfy as there are also for the taught. The conditions necessary for the taught are purity, a real thirst after knowledge and perseverance. No impure soul can really be religious. Purity in thought, speech and act 
is absolutely necessary for anyone to be religious. As to the thirst after knowledge, it is an old law that we all get whatever we want. None of us can get anything other than what we fix our hearts upon. To pant for religion truly is a very difficult thing, not at all so easy as we generally imagine. Hearing religious talks or rereading religious books is no proof yet of a real want felt in the heart. There must be a continuous struggle, a constant fight, an unremitting grappling with our lower nature till the higher want is actually felt and the victory is achieved. It is not a question of one or two days, of years or of lives. The struggle may have to go on for hundreds of lifetimes. The success sometimes may come immediately, but we must be ready to wait patiently even for what may look like an infinite length of time. The student who sets out with such a spirit of perseverance will surely find success and realization at last. With regard to the teacher, we must see that he knows the spirit of the scriptures. The whole world reads Bibles, Vedas and Qurans, but they are only words. Syntax, etymology, philosophy, philology, the dry bones of religion. The teacher who deals too much in words and allows the mind to be carried away by the force of words loses the spirit. It is the knowledge of the spirit of these scriptures alone that constitutes the true religious teacher. The network of words of the scripture is like a huge forest in which the human mind often loses itself and finds no way out. The network of words is a big forest. It is the cause of a curious wandering of the mind. The various methods of joining words, the various methods of speaking in a beautiful language, the various methods of explaining the diction of the scriptures are only for the disputations and enjoyment of the learned. They do not conduce to the development of spiritual perception. Those who employ such methods to impart religion to others are only desirous to show off their own learning so that the world may praise them as great scholars you will find that no one of the great teachers of the world ever went into these various explanations of the text. There is with them no attempt at text torturing, no eternal playing upon the meaning of words and their roots. Yet they nobly taught, while others who have nothing to teach have taken up a word sometimes and written a three-volume book on its origin on the man who used it first, and on what that man was accustomed to eat, and how long he slept, and so on. Bhagawan Ramakrishna used to tell a story of some men who went into a mango orchard and busied themselves in counting the leaves, the twigs, and the branches, examining their color, comparing their size, and noting down everything most carefully, and then got up a learned discussion on each of these topics, which were undoubtedly highly interesting to them. But one of them, more sensible than the others, did not care for all these things, and instead thereof began to eat the mango fruit. And was he not wise? So leave this counting of leaves and twigs and note-taking to others. This kind of work has its proper place, but not here in the spiritual domain. You never see a strong spiritual man among these leaf counters. Religion, the highest aim, 
The highest glory of man does not require so much labor. If you want to be a bhakta, it is not at all necessary for you to know whether Krishna was born in Mathura or stays in Vajra, what he is doing, or just the exact date on which he pronounced the teachings of the Gita. You only require to feel the craving for the beautiful lessons of duty and love in the Gita. All the other particulars about it and its author are for the enjoyment of the learned. Let them have what they desire. Say, Shanti, Shanti, meaning peace, peace, to their learned controversies, and let us eat the mangoes. The second condition necessary in the teacher is sinlessness. The question is often asked, why should we look into the character and personality of a teacher? We have only to judge of what he says and take that up. This is not right. If a man wants to teach me something of dynamics or chemistry or any other physical science, he may be anything he likes, because what the physical sciences require is merely an intellectual equipment. But in the spiritual sciences, it is impossible from first to last that there can be any spiritual light in the soul that is impure. What religion can an impure man teach? The sign qua non of acquiring spiritual truth for oneself or for imparting it to others is the purity of heart and soul. A vision of God or a glimpse of the beyond never comes until the soul is pure. Hence, with the teacher of religion, we must see first what he is and then what he says. He must be perfectly pure and then alone comes the value of his words because he is only then the true transmitter. What can he transmit if he has not spiritual power in himself? There must be the worthy vibration of spirituality in the mind of the teacher, so that it may be sympathetically conveyed to the mind of the taught. The function of the teacher is indeed an affair of the transference of something and not one of mere stimulation of the existing intellectual or other faculties in the taught. Something real and appreciable as an influence comes from the teacher and goes to the taught. Therefore, the teacher must be pure. The third condition is in regard to motive. The teacher must not teach with any ulterior selfish motive for money, name or fame. His work must be simply out of love, out of pure love for mankind at large. The only mediums through which spiritual force can be transmitted is love. Any selfish motives such as the desire for gain or for name will immediately destroy this conveying medium. God is love, and only he who has known God as love can be a teacher of godliness and God to man. When you see that in your teacher these conditions are all fulfilled, you are safe. If they are not, it is unsafe to allow yourself to be taught by him, for there is a great danger that if he cannot convey goodness to your heart, he may convey wickedness. 
This danger must by all means be guarded against. He who is learned in the scriptures, sinless, unpolluted by lust, and is the greatest knower of the Brahman, is the real teacher. From what has been said, it naturally follows that we cannot be taught to love, appreciate, and assimilate religion everywhere and by everybody. The sermons in stones, books in the running brooks, and good in everything is all very true as a poetical figure, but nothing can impart to a man a single grain of truth unless he has the undeveloped germs of it in himself. To whom do the stones and brooks preach sermons? To the human soul, the lotus of whose inner holy shrine is already quick with life, and the light which causes the beautiful opening out of this lotus comes always from the good and wise teacher. When the heart has thus been opened, it becomes fit to receive teaching from the stones or the brooks, the stars or the sun or the moon, or from anything which has its existence in our divine universe. But the unopened heart will see in them nothing but mere stones or mere brooks. A blind man may go to a museum, but he will not profit by it in any way. His eyes must be open first, and then alone will he be able to learn what the things in the museum can teach. This eye-opener of the aspirant after religion is the teacher. With the teacher, therefore, our relationship is the same as that between an ancestor and his descendant. Without faith, humility, submission and veneration in our hearts towards our religious teacher, there can be not any growth of religion in us. And it is a significant fact that where this kind of relation and between the teacher and the taught prevails, there alone gigantic spiritual men are growing. While in those countries which have neglected to keep up this kind of relation, the religious teacher has become a mere lecturer. The teacher expecting his five dollars and the person expecting his brain to be filled with the teacher's words, and each going his own way after this much has been done. Under such circumstances, spirituality becomes almost an unknown quantity. There is none to transmit it, and none to have it transmitted to. Religion with such people becomes business, they think they can obtain it with their dollars. Would to God that religion could be obtained so easily. But unfortunately it cannot be. Religion, which is the highest knowledge and the highest wisdom, cannot be bought, nor can it be acquired from books. You may thrust your head into all the corners of the world, you may explore the Himalayas, the Alps, and the Caucasus. You may sound the bottom of the sea and pry into every nook of Tibet and the desert of Gobi. You will not find it anywhere until your heart is ready for receiving it and your teacher has come. And when that divinely appointed teacher comes, Serve him with childlike confidence and simplicity, freeing open your heart to his influence, and see in him God manifested. Those who come to seek truth with such a spirit of love and veneration, to them the Lord of truth 
reveals the most wonderful things regarding truth, goodness, and beauty.